Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to Google. Uh, my name is Vivek. Um, you don't have to parse the rest of it. Uh, I'm from the University of Southern California. And the theme of my talk today is um, deriving and utilizing rich representations in spoken language translation. So before I go into the details of my talk, just a brief background about myself. Uh, I'm from Chennai, and I joined USC in 2002 after completing my bachelor's in India. And I've been working in the speech analysis and interpretation lab with uh, Professor Srikant Narayanan since 2004. Um, I'd also like to clarify that the, uh, pr the talk is predominantly going to focus on the work that I did as part of my dissertation, but I've also worked on, I've been fortunate to have been involved in several other projects uh, funded by several agencies. Uh, I'd be more than happy to discuss about any of these projects in detail after my talk. Okay, so this is going to be the outline of my talk. So I'll start with the general big picture motivation of why this work is important and where it fits into the larger scheme of things in state of the art and speech processing. Uh, I'll then formulate the problem of using these so-called rich information in a speech-to-speech -speech translation framework, after which I'll step back and tell you about the various techniques that we've developed for automatic enrichment of uh, automatic enrichment, specifically talk about two aspects. One is prosodic information and the other is discourse information, uh, after which I'll demonstrate the utility in speech translation and conclude along with some directions for future work. So let me start with uh, an example. So in so imagine a doctor-patient interaction scenario where the doctor is talking, and this is the output of automatic speech recognition. So your chest pain's been going on just for two days, is that right? Okay. So the question is, beyond this string of words, what more can we infer? So there are a lot of things that you can say. So if you were to do speaker recognition here, you can identify this as speaker one. And if you were to find out from a database, you can index speaker one as being the doctor. You could also say that the prominent words, either syntactically prominent or prosodically prominent words in this particular utterance are chest pains and for two days. Uh, you could also imagine chunking this utterance into different prosodic phrases or syntactic phrases and further say that the conversational act of this utterance is a yes-no question. So the, these are the kinds of rich information beyond words that we are interested in in this work and I'll talk about these things in further detail. So more from uh, an application perspective, I would also like to uh, motivate the problem from what are the different applications that this research is useful for. Uh, I'd like you to keep these applications at the back of your mind and see how it uh, relates to the rest of the talk as I progress. So one typical scenario is a customer call application. So typically in call centers, you receive a large volume of calls with accurate detection of what the, uh, the customer is saying. You can either read out the calls or use it as a quality assessment tool. So if, for example, if you get a large number of questions, you can see that there's something wrong with the, the system. And another um, area that is of increasing interest, and in, especially to Google, from text is information extraction. So you're interested in finding out what are the important entities given particular text. So I'm going to play you a video here. Um, the point I want to try to make here is Going beyond lexical information and syntactic information, you can also extract rich information uh, using prosodic aspects and acoustic aspects of speech. So the output that you'd see on the right side is, is not real time, but the output is the system that I developed as part of my PhD work. Conversation here tonight with all three candidates in the race for president. We'll talk about Dr. King's civil rights and where we go from here. Also, tax returns. The Clintons have finally made theirs public. American jobs. The bad news today, that tens of thousands of jobs have vanished. So as you can see here, the words that are marked in green are actually the prosodically more emphatic words, as well as the parentheses indicate phrasing, but prosodic phrasing, using pause, duration, and other kinds of information. So this is one application. The third application that is of particular interest to us is an enriched speech-to-speech -speech translation framework. So conventional applications treat speech-to-speech -speech translation as a compartmentalized task. So you have uh, source signal being converted to source text using ASR, uh, source text being converted, translated into target text using machine translation, and then target text being synthesized on the target side using text-to-speech synthesis. So as you see, a lot of rich information that's present in the source side is lost during the translation process. So the idea here is if you were to take the hypothesis on the source side, find out certain rich information about these utterances or word level information, such as say the intention of this particular sentence is a yes no question, you can not only use that information within the speech translation framework, but you can also use it to augment the translation. So I've given an example here. The reference is, is this a painkiller uh, for this sentence in Farsi? The hypothesis is this is a painkiller. Even if you look at the 100 best hypothesis, you always get this is a painkiller. 
Uh, on the other hand, if you were to transfer the intention from the source side to the target side as a yes-no question, you can either use it for disambiguation or sentence reordering on the target side. So these are some of the applications that uh, the talk that I'll be describing is going to be applicable to. Uh, in terms of a research goal, the basic research goal of this work is to develop statistical frameworks to detect and extract rich information from speech and text. And this pertains to both representation as well as modeling of these events. And then we are interested in exploiting these annotations in spoken language processing, uh, specifically in applications such as speech translation and speech understanding. So the question that pops up is, why do you think it's important? So we believe that uh, extracting and detecting this information can provide valuable complementary information uh, that can inform several linguistic modules in speech processing. So having given a general motivation, let me formulate this problem. So as I mentioned a few slides back, a uh, conventional speech-to-speech -speech translation system has these three independent sub-blocks. So you try to optimize e the performance of each block uh, individually. Say the ASR with the word error rate metric, machine translation with blue score or NIST score, uh, the TTS with some mean opinion score or some sub subjective evaluation metric. The problem here is that the focus of the translation itself is the content. So you do not utilize a lot of rich information that pres is present on the source side of the speech, such as what is being said on the source side, how it's being said. And as I mentioned, the compartmentalization by itself introduces a lot of noise in the channel. So my hypothesis here is to convey not only what is communicated, but also how it's being communicated. Having said that, how can we improve current systems? So there's been a plethora of work recently, uh, especially in the MT community, in using a lot of linguistic information in translation, uh, specifically things like syntax as well as morphology. So in contrast to these approaches, what we are interested in is to augment or supplement speech-to-speech -speech translation systems with these rich, so-called rich annotations. These can range from either prosodic prominence, phrasing, discourse information, to simple things like disfluencies, topics, and so on. So uh, these have been previously used in both spoken language understanding and automatic speech recognition in several NIST evaluation tasks, but we are interested in uh, applying it for speech translation. Okay, so this is a basic problem formulation. I don't want to go into the details, but contrast this conventional approach with our approach. So essentially you have a source speed signal and you want to get to the target speech. So the compartmentalized approach converts the source speech to target uh, source text using ASR either the one best hypothesis or a lattice on the source side to the target text using machine translation, and then synthesizes finally on it using um, the TTS. So in contrast, what we are interested in doing is, let's for now assume that we either have rich annotations on the source side or on the target side. So at the output of ASR, what we are interested in doing is inferring these rich annotations from both the speech and text information, using these annotations within the machine translation framework as well as supplementing them for the TTS part. So it's, it's, it's in spirit different from conventional approaches. So I, I'd like to clarify that even though there are a lot of possibilities that you can use this framework for, we restrict ourselves to two particular kinds of rich information. One is prosodic information, the other is discourse information captured through dialogue at tags. So I'll explain what these are in the forthcoming slides. So let's say that we, we did have access to this LS and LT, so-called rich annotations, either on the source side or on the target side. The question is, to use it within translation, how do we detect these automatically? And we, know, we need to also detect them robustly. Okay. So I'll just give you a brief background about um, what, what kinds of prosodic aspects we address in this work and what kinds of discourse information and dialogue information that we address. So the two aspects of prosody that we are interested in is uh, prominence and phrasing. So let me explain this with the help of an example. So you have the sentence here that says, the Pentagon reports fighting in six southern Iraqi cities. So if you were to look at the more prominent words here, you would say this as, the Pentagon reports fighting in six southern Iraqi cities. So prominence is nothing but these are properties such as intonation, rhythm, and lexical stress patterns that confer emphasis, intent, and emotion to certain linguistic units. You could also imagine phrasing this utterance in a particular way. You could say that the Pentagon reports fighting in six southern Iraqi cities. Okay, so that's the way in which you pause and other durational aspects. So that's called as phrasing. So essentially, you're chunking the utterance into episodic phrases, which helps you in appropriate interpretation of a sentence. So the problem with detecting these kinds of prominence and uh, phrasing information is that you need some kind of reliable intermediate representation. To, uh, to facilitate robust supervised learning. 
So for that, what we use here is a categorical representation of prominence and tracing uh, using a scheme called the Stones and Break Indices Framework. So I won't go into the details of it, but again, give you an example just to understand what it is. So essentially, if you have a sentence and the pitch contour of the sentence, um, there are two labels, namely the pitch accent and boundary labels that represent phrasing. So each word is assigned, or a syllable is assigned to a particular pitch accent and boundary tone. The presence of that label means that that word is accented, and the absence of that label on the word means that it's an unaccented version. At the same time, for phrasing, what it does is, is it assigns a number from 0 to 4. Uh, higher the number, the larger the perceived disjuncture between two words. Okay, so we essentially assume here that we have access to human annotated data that has have these kinds of labels and we can do automatic supervised learning with this. Now the problem here is if you look at a typical corpora, typical corpus, you have a really large collection of labels. Okay, this is almost like 28 or 32 labels. So to do reliable learning on such a large vocabulary, label vocabulary, is quite difficult. So in literature, what people do usually is to either uh, to, to map these labels into intermediate categories or into very coarse categories. So presence of any of these labels means that it's an accented version of the word. Absence of these means that it's, you know, there is no accent in the word. Similarly for the break indices. So these are the kinds of categories that we're interested in automatically detecting. On the discourse side, what we're interested in doing is detecting dialogue act tags, which are nothing but labels that represent communicative acts. So if you have an utterance, what you're interested in saying is this utterance is a statement it's a yes, no question, or an acknowledgement, and things like that. And typically in English, as well as in several languages, such as Spanish and Dutch, uh, these kinds of dialogue act tags highly correlate with lexical, syntactic, as well as international cues. So I won't go into the details of this because of time constraints. I'm sorry, for both of those, is there reasonable agreement in terms of, you know, if you get somebody to do the labeling? Yeah. So the internet data agreement for this one is about 84%. And so that's a Kappa score of about 8, which is 0.8, that's reliable. For the prosody part, it's uh, it's depending on the corpora. It's almost from eighty to ninety percent. Okay. Hello, greetings. Hi, uh, greetings. We have a lot of trouble getting into the, the call. Okay. Should I, should I? Hey, can you guys see the slides? No. No. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. Should I should I go ahead? Uh, yeah. okay. So again, to just give you an example, these are the kinds of dialogue acts that we are automatically... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So with the question, though, you said 84% oh, yeah. agreement. That was on the labeling for... Um, for the dialogue, the dialogue acts. Act. For the prosody part, the prosody it's, part. it ranges from 80 to 90% depending on the corpora. Okay. So for spontaneous speech, it's slightly less accurate. For red speech, it's much more accurate. So the experiments that I'll uh, present in the later slides, uh, I've done it for both red speech and spontaneous speech, and I'll... Uh, compare the accuracies that I've obtained with internet data agreements. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Okay, before we go into um, schemes for automatically detecting this, these kinds of rich information, there are some challenges. One is to choose a reliable representation. That's what I was talking about. So you need some kind of human annotated data that's reliable with high interlabel agreement. The second thing is that the cues, the lexical, syntactic, as well as uh, supra-segment, prosodic cues, occur typically at different time scales. So there's usually no consensus on a generative model, and uh, they also highly overlapping features. So you need to do smart ways of feature selection before you use these features in a framework. And another problem is, how do you infer and inform these uh, ASR and MT in lockstep with this information? So you are essentially not interested in doing an offline computation, but also an online computation. So you get these information and use it immediately in other linguistic modules. So the proposed solution for this part of the work is a maximum entropy technique. So I won't go into the algorithmic details, but tell you more of why we used it for this, for this particular task and the details of uh, the implementation. So we use a task essentially here because it's a nice way of handling overlapping features, and it's not hurt by strong independence assumptions. And we also figured that it was a robust way of com uh, combining different pieces of diverse contextual evidence. We've also done it with CRFs and other things, but it doesn't scale as well as the maximum entropy technique. So essentially, the formulation here is given a sequence of linguistic units. These either could be words, so the prosody labels we are interested in predicting at the word level, the dialogue act label we are interested in predicting at the utterance level. So given a linguistic unit and a particular label vocabulary, we are interested in estimating the distribution using the maxent technique. So the features here that we use are 
the lexical features are nothing but the words uh, in terms of the word bigrams and trigrams. The syntactic features that we use over a window are uh, part of speech tags, which are automatically extracted. Uh, the label set is 47 tags from the pen tree bank. Uh, we also use a shallow syntactic structure in terms of super tags. Super tags are nothing but they're tags that encapsulate the predicate argument structure in a local tree. So these I, I obtained from the extract tools of UPenn. Um, so that's the syntactic feature part. So we also use acoustic features in this work. So uh, the conventional approach of using prosodic or acoustic features for this kind of work is you would take an entire segment, extract the pitch contour of that segment, and extract as many summative statistics as you want, such as the slope, range, mean, minimum, and so on. Just throw everything into a classifier and let the classifier learn what the important features are. So in contrast to this, it was more of an approach that was tried at SRI and it's still being used. We are interested in exploring a different uh, alternative. So what we do here is, given a particular segment, once we get the prosodic contour, we normalize the sequence of values with the speaker-specific means and variances. We quantize these acoustic prosodic observations in terms of some quantization precision. And then we extract n-gram features out of this acoustic prosodic contour. So instead of getting a summative statistics, we are interested in more of a fine-grained approach where we extract n-grams of this acoustic prosodic values. So I'll tell you in also the uh, next couple of slides why this performs better and give you some numbers. Before, I'm sorry, so what is a normalized pitch contour? I mean, did you go, is that's it log just, or is it? Uh, no, that's just the pitch contour value. That's just the pitch extracted at every 10 millisecond interval. Okay, and what does zero mean, or 0 0.25? That, that's compared to the mean for the speaker? Uh, over here? Yeah, so it's basically, what are those yeah, it's, it's the xenom. Okay. It's a xenom of the value that you obtain here. So every speaker has a speaker-specific mean and variance. So you take the xenom, and that's the xenom. Okay. And then you quantize that value into some precision that you want. So depending on the amount of data that you have and the performance that you're interested in, you can quantize into, into bins and then extract n-gram features. The idea is to, the way in which Maxon uses lexical features, you're interested in using acoustic features in a similar fashion. And then you want to compare it with the conventional approaches that use all the slope and range and those kinds of things right. and see how well it compares uh, to that. Okay. So you're using Z-norm, if it's voiced and if it's unvoiced, what do you do? So we first perform linear interpolation, smoothing and everything, and then only then uh, we take the uh, contour and then apply the Z-norm. So we have a pre-processing step where we do the linear interpolation and smoothing. Just, linear interpolation of the unvoiced there, will, there will be regions of speech that will not be voiced. So we do linear interpolation for that. So if you have two segments of voiced, and then we just linearly interpolate the contour there. You linearly interpolate the contour so that um, there's a value for every frame. Value for every frame, exactly. And, and, and there's seven numbers there? Is that, do those seven no, that's numbers just an example that, uh, over here? Yeah, those seven numbers, right. Yeah. You, 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 that's just uh, basically a 70 millisecond interval. So, so, so it's every 10 milliseconds every is what that's trying to say. That's time. Interval, right. Okay. Okay, so having given the motivation, so let me just explain what we are interested in detecting in prosody. So given an utterance, we are interested in classifying each word into a particular category. So it can either have an accent or no accent. So I've just indicated an accent with a star because it was too big otherwise. And either a boundary tone or a break index. So an, a larger number for break index means that there is a phrase break there. Okay, so these are the kinds of super labels that we're interested in classifying each word as, and then they, are as a, they, they can be used as a function of either prominence or phrasing. Okay. Uh, the data that we've used for these experiments uh, range are from in two categories, two genres. One is the red speech corpus. That's uh, essentially we use the Boston University Radio News corpus that's been used for ages, since 90s, for experiments and prosody. We also used a unique uh, spontaneous speech corpus that uh, Mari was kind enough to uh, grant, uh, grant for our particular purpose. Uh, essentially, it's a subset of the switchboard corpus, which is completely human annotated. So I don't want you to get overwhelmed with the numbers, but the point I wanted to make in this table is that for the BU corpus, we use four speakers, and the validation is performed as leave one out speaker validation. Um, similarly, for the BDC corpus, and for switchboard corpus, we do a tenfold cross validation. It has about 128 speakers. So the point, again, being uh, it's different genres of speech, uh, it's different vocabularies, and also much larger training and test sets. OK. So uh, before I go into the, some of the uh, results, I would also like to see, uh, say that the results are all reported on identical data sets used in previous work. So they're exactly same training and test splits used in 
uh, Mark Hasegawa Johnson at UIUC. So we borrowed the training and test splits, and they have several papers on performing this automatic detection. So if these are accuracy numbers. Uh, a means by using only acoustic features. S is by using syntactic and lexical features. And A plus S is using all the features available to, uh, to a person. So if you look at the numbers for both the pitch accent and the boundary tone uh, scenarios, our accuracies are uh, reasonably good. And the pitch accent accuracy is also slightly better than previous work. But the problem here is that if I were to extract the acoustic features for a given word, I need to know where it starts and where it ends. So I need to know the time index. Okay, so essentially, you need to know some kind of force alignment knowledge. So that's not always um, present. So we went back to the drawing board. And what we did here was more of a speech approach. So what we did was we trained continuous density hidden marker models to represent these speech, uh, pitch accents and boundary tones. Essentially, instead of the 39-dimensional MFCC feature, you have the pitch, the energy, uh, uh, energy value, as well as the delta and acceleration coefficients. So you train a hidden marker model over this. Okay. That also leads to a very general question. Okay, you know that maximum entropy model is very good for using lexical and syntactic features. The HMM model might be good for using the acoustic features. Is there a nice way of combining these two models? Okay. So what we came with is essentially a FST implementation for this. So what the syntactic model, the maxim model, does is gives you a posterior probability table. So here, each word has either an accented version or an unaccented version. Okay, and that's the posterior probability. So what we did was we converted this into an FST, where each pair of links, uh, each pair of nodes have two links. One is the accented version, the other is the unaccented version. On the other hand, what, what the acoustic model gives you is simply a lattice. What we go ahead and compose these two lattices, and then find the best path through this lattice. So essentially, it's a way of combining the output of a discriminative model with the generative model. So and here in the acoustic model, you don't have to rely on the word boundary information. So these are, again, some of the results uh, using this approach. Uh, as you see, by going from the Maxim acoustic syntactic model to the combined maximum entropy plus hidden Markov model, the results that we've got using both acoustic and syntactic features are all uh, better than previously reported work on identical training and test sets. So this is also good in the sense that since we decouple these features, so if you had access to only speech recognition and only the acoustics, you can use this acoustic model. If you are doing it more for a TTS purpose, you can use only the lexical and syntactic features. And if you're using it for things like speech understanding or dialogue modeling, you can use both the acoustic and syntactic features. So as I mentioned, we've also done this for phrase break detection. Just to remind you of the problem, essentially at each word we want to detect what the break index is. And a higher value of break index means that there is a phrase break there. So you would say the sentence is, the Boston School Committee, religious and community leaders, have already come to loggerheads over the issue. So again, I just don't want to go into delve into details, but we've compared it with um, also state of the art, out of the box um, labelers such as festival uh, TTS, uh, you know, festival as well as AT and T Natural Voices Toolkit have these kinds of small modules that can predict these. So we tried it on those things too. By using the same approach that I proposed in the previous uh, couple of slides, uh, we get absolute improvements of almost four percent over previous work for. Um, phrase break detection also. And we've also tried it for spontaneous speech. So there was this JHU workshop in 2006 with uh, Professor Mary Harper, and they were interested in structural event detection. So we did it on identical test splits uh, as they had done. And even for that, we, uh, our results are almost uh, stat you know, if you perform statistical significant tests, they're not very different from the JHU uh, results. So in summary, I'd like to summarize the part where I've done the prosody recognition part. This is more of a chronological sequence of things that I did in my graduate school life. Uh, so we exploited simple local lexical and syntactic features uh, where we were able to reliably detect prosodic prominence and phrasing. So in comparison, I didn't want to go through previous work. Uh, there's a lot of efforts that have a lot of hand-labeled data. So the kind of features that we extract are come at a very minimal cost. We're just getting words, syntactic information, and the acoustic information from the pitch contour. And the n-gram feature representation seems to be a nice way of uh, characterizing intonation. And it's kind of different, and it's not been done before. And the results are also close to the internal data agreements. And as part of this particular uh, subset of my work, I've also developed a tagger that can work both on red speech and spontaneous speech. So given an utterance, it can do all the stuff that I mentioned here and give you spit out the values. Okay. 
So let's move on to the Dialogue Act part. So just again to remind you, given an utterance, what we're interested in doing here is either detecting this utterance as a very detailed category, such as it's a statement, opinionated statement, non-opinionated statement, it's a yes, no question, or into a very simplified Dialogue Act accent. So in a lot of applications, we don't want to find a very detailed level, but we just want to say if it's a question, a statement, or an acknowledgment. Now there are two challenges that are uh, prevalent in automatic Dialogue Act det uh, detection. One is, we all know that, okay, so if you say a yes, no question, typically your pitch raises and things like that. But how do you meaningfully use this kind of information in an actual application? So there have been a lot of efforts at SRA and other places which derive summative statistics of the pitch and energy contour, as I mentioned a few slides back. So can we do better than that? That's question one. The second question is, how do we exploit dialogue history? So in a lot of cases, you know that if you say something that's an opinionated statement, the other person on the other side is either going to give you an acknowledgement or you know, he's going to refuse it. At the same time, if you ask a question, the other subject is most likely to, uh, going to give you an answer in terms of a statement. So the classical way of doing this in previous work is to use an HMM-like approach, where essentially the states or the dialogue are tags, and the observations are nothing but the words. So instead of building a language model over the words, you build a discourse language model over the dialogue act tags. Okay, so before I tell you why our method is different and why it works better, what are the two corpora that we've tried it on? So we've tried it on the switchboard damsel corpus, uh, which is essentially a generalized tag set. You can think of it as being applicable to a variety of tasks. Um, it has a 42 tag vocabulary, but not in all cases you don't need this such, such a deep vocabulary, so you just need a very simple vocabulary such as, you know, you just want to find out whether it's a statement, acknowledgement, whether it's an abandoned utterance, agreement, question, appreciation. So this is based on previous work. We've also tried our uh, experiments on the map task, map task corpus, which essentially is more of a task-specific uh, domain. So I have some numbers first for the uh, you know, results for using only the acoustic information. So what I want to compare here is previous work that has used summative statistics. So the numbers here have absolutely no knowledge of lexical or syntactic information. By just using acoustics, how well can you do? So by using previous work and a very simple decision tree uh, classifier, the accuracy is about 45%. By using the n-gram acoustic features that I described in this work, we are able to get almost a 6% improvement over previous work. And by using these features in a maximum entropy framework, we can get a little bit more juice here. So this is all just using acoustic features, no lexical or syntactic features. Can you go back to that slide? Yep. When you say uh, you're using n-gram features, are you talking about a generative model where each of the different uh, uh, No, types? this is not a generative model. This is the maximum entropy model. So given a particular well, utterance. When you say, uh, so these are all in the uh, maxent model? Yeah, these are all in the maxent model. Okay. So the other thing that I mentioned was exploiting dialogue history. So if you were to do, again, an HMM-like approach and to do optimal decoding, you would have to do a Viterbi forward backward uh, decoding with a discourse LM. You essentially have to build up the trellis and you have to wait for the entire conversation to complete. So there are a couple of approaches to overcome this. One, you can do a greedy decoding approach where at each state you make the decision based on only the information in the previous state. But in contrast to this, what we are interested in doing is coming up with a maxin based online dialogue act tagging. Uh, essentially, so for example, for utterance 3, if you want to make the decision, what we use here are features from utterance 3, lexical, syntactic, and prosodic features, and only features from previous utterances. So we don't want to wait to find out what the dialogue act tag of the previous utterance is, but just dump all the features from previous utterances and make a decision at this particular point. So it's, it's more like you can do the decoding in an online fashion. OK, so how, how well does it compare with uh, the greedy decoding? So the blue bar here. Uh, for map task, and this is for the switchboard damsel corpus with 42 tags, and the switchboard damsel corpus with seven tags. So obviously, seven tag case is a subset, so it performs slightly better. Okay, there's less uh, confusability. The, the, green, uh, the blue bar represents greedy decoding. The green bar represents the maximum entropy technique with oracle knowledge. So you essentially exactly know what the previous three dialogue act tags are. The orange bar here represents the maxin with only features from three previous utterances. So you don't assume any knowledge of dialogue acts, but you have only features from previous utterances. So if you see, for all the three corpora, the drop in performance is not that significant. So you can still get really good performance of dialogue act tag detection 
almost as well as knowing what the previous dialogue act tag is. And the immediate question, you know, when I give this talk is, why did you try only three previous utterances? You know, you could have tried four, five, six. So there's not much information that you get, even going beyond two previous utterances. So the most knowledge is present in what the person said previously compared to what the person said six turns before. So just to demonstrate that I've not tried it only on reference transcripts, I've also tried it on ASR output. So this was actually a separate project that I did in grad school. So this was uh, an acoustic model that I trained, uh, which is a speaker independent model, trained in about 250 hours of Fisher corpus. And you know the usual tricks, there, there was speaker adapter training on the first pass lattice and things like that. And the language model was also quite robust with low perplexity. So I tried the same um, test set with ASR output. So the word error rate for this switchboard corpus that I cho chose is quite high. It's almost 34% word error rate. So if you look at the performance again for greedy decoding with ASR output, with Maxen by assuming that you know what the previous three dialogue act tags are, and with Maxen with only features from the three previous utterances, they're again quite close. So overall in terms of performance, there's almost um, a 10% drop from um, reference transcripts to ASR output, even with you know when the word error rate is quite high, so you can get almost 70 to 75 percent accuracy for uh, what the dialogue act tag is at the output of ASR. Yeah. So, so that makes sense. Have you, maybe it's the next part of the talk, but are, are you are you going to ever feed back this information into the ASR process and maybe change the acoustic models or the language models given conditioned on the yeah uh, actually dialogue state or yeah, dialogue the, act? I mean. The rest of the talk will um, be about how to use this in speech translation. So okay. there was this work that I did for about six months as part of graduate school life, where I was trying to play around with these features, feedback in the ASR, and yeah. use it for rescoring the lattices and things like that. I wasn't getting substantial improvements, and okay. you know, it was it was something that people had grinded out for a long time. So it was more challenging in using these kinds of things in translation. Got it. But I did try those things. Yeah. <clears throat> so in, in summary for the recognition of dialogue acts, so the engram features seem to be capturing the pitch patterns better and exploiting the features from just previous utterances is almost as good as using a separate discourse model. And as this subset of this work, I also developed a dialogue act tagger which essentially will take the utterance, either will just take the speed signal, do ASR, get the features and give you the dialogue act tag based on what corpora you want. So if you want your model trained in the map task corpus, it will give you labels pertaining to the map task corpus or to switchboard corpus. So just as an um, offline point, um, offline optimal decoding by constructing the entire lattice, doing forward-backward algorithm, gives you about 71% accuracy on the switchboard corpus. This is uh, results of Stolke et al. from SRI. By using the online decoding framework, it's about 72%. So you can't directly compare these two numbers because the test sets are different. Uh, they had about a 4K test set, and we had about 30,000 utterances as a test set. So it's a much larger test set, and it seems to be performing uh, reasonably well. OK, so I've told you the tools that I've developed for automatic detection of prosody and dialogue act tags. And fortunately, they've also performed uh, reasonably well in comparison with other um, efforts in literature. So the question is, how do you exploit this kind of information in translation? So that was the question we were trying to ask. How do we detect these things? So I've told you how. Okay. Now I'll tell you how to use these kinds of information in translation. So first I'll talk about dialogue act tags and how do you exploit them in translation. So we have two approaches here. One is phrase-based translation that I extended, and the other is an approach that was presented by Srinivas Bangalore et al. at at and So I took their system and tried to extend their system to incorporate dialogue act tags. So I'll talk about phrase-based translation first. So everyone knows this, these are our basics. So given a parallel corpus of you know, sentence-aligned parallel corpora, we generate word alignments and then essentially generate the phrase translation table from the word alignments and the heuristics. So essentially you have the uh, source, source phrases and then the target phrases. So in a typical phrase-based translation system, you have the tar uh, source text being converted to target text. Now let's say you can also find out what the source dialogue act tag is. Okay? So that is Ellis. So if you were to decompose this using base decomposition, it essentially leads to a dialogue act specific phrase translation table and a dialogue act specific language model. Instead of just having a phrase translation table for the entire data and a language model, now you have dialogue act specific translation and language models. Now you can do translation with this kind of model. But the problem is if you have a really large phrase translation table and you're splitting it into seven or eight different translation tables, it leads to a lot of um, 
out of vocabulary phrases. Okay, so one particular table might not have the phrases present in another table. So you need to come up with, uh, with smart ways of, of backing off to the original translation table. So what we do here is essentially build a translation table with the entire data, build a dialog act specific translation table, and then we interpolate it with some weights. So basically, this is a back off factor. You can think of it essentially as a language model. So you want to adapt your language model to a topic specific language model. So I'll illustrate this actually with an example, which will make it much clearer. So if you have this parallel corpus, say English, Chinese, and you have n sentences here, what you do is on the source side, you tag each sentence with a dialogue act tag. Okay. So it lead to different translation tables. So if you have seven different dialogue act tags, you'll have seven different translation tables. You build the phrase translation table for using the entire data. You build the phrase translation table for each of the dialogue act specific translation tables. And then you interpolate the phrases here with the baseline translation table with some weight. So you optimize that weight on a held out set. So that's the system. So I'll tell you how it works in performance, but I also like to describe before that what the bag of words approach is. So, the tron so it's, I hope it's clear what the phrase-based translation approach is and what the extension we've made. The bag of words approach is essentially um, given an entire source utterance. Okay, what you want to do is independently <coughs> uh, detect each target word. So if you have n words in your vocabulary, you want to detect what is the probability of seeing that seeing a word um, x in the presence of this entire source sentence. So you detect each word individually, and then you take that bag of words and reorder them with a language model. So essentially, given an entire source sentence, you form n-grams of this source sentence and detect each word in the target vocabulary independently. So the idea here is you can use n static binary classifiers, because whether the presence of a word in this context is it, it, whether it's present or not, you can do it independently. Okay. Now the problem here is doing it is not difficult, but the reordering is a big pain because all that you get is a bag of words. How are you going to permute this bag of words? So if you have a really large number of words, it's 20 words, you can have 20 factorial combination of these words. Okay. So what we do here is we take the bag of words approach and also assume that we have knowledge of what the dialogue art tag is. Okay. So essentially, instead of getting a bag of words in the target, we are getting not only we are not only using the information of the dialogue art tag on the source side, but we are also transferring to, to the target side. Okay. So instead of just using the bag of word grams on the source side, we also know what the dialogue art tag of the source side is. So we're factoring it within the translation. And for reordering, the advantage is that when you try all permutations of the words weighted by a general language model, now you have access to a dialogue act specific language model. So you can hope that a language model for statements is going to perform much better than you know, a, language, a general, gener generic language model. Or if you have a language model for questions, it can perform better than a generic language model. Okay. So we've tried these experiments on several different corpora. Uh, we've tried it on the Farsi English corpus that was obtained as um, a part of the TransTAC effort. It's basically doctor-patient mediated interactions. It's, uh, it's microphone speech. And the Japanese English corpus is the how may I help you corpus that I obtained from AT&T, which has telephone speech. And the Chinese English corpus is the IWSLT corpus that is usually released for IWSLT evaluations. So again, uh, the point I want to make with this big table is that these are different language pairs the training data substantially changes. It's about 8,000 utterances here, 12,000 utterances here, and 46,000 utterances for the Chinese English case. Okay. <clears throat> so th these are some of the results for each language pair for the phrase-based translation approach, for the bag of words approach. This is the blue score without any dialogue act tags. So if you were to just do plain translation, this is with the dialogue act tags, with the seven tag case and the 42 tag case. What I have here is the F score. F score is nothing but it's just the intersection of number of words in the result and reference. And so you take the precision and recall and then compute the F score. So it doesn't take into consideration the phrases, but just how many words you get right in your uh, result. So if you were to look at the approach, for all three language pairs, we are able to get improvements in the blue score um, for the Farsi English case, for the Japanese English case, as well as the Chinese English case. The improvements are a little bit more pronounced for 
the Chinese English corpus as well as the Farsi corpus compared to the Japanese English corpus. And similarly, just because of the nature of the model, you can expect, because we're not interested in generating phrases, but only in bag of words, the bag of words model gives you much better lexical selection accuracy. So the F scores are much better than using a phrase-based translation approach, but obviously the blue score is not that good because your reordering is not a very robust way of reordering. So I'm sorry, how do these numbers compare to you know, uh, competitive systems that don't use DA tags on these, that are only trained on these tasks? Is this, is this um, state of the art? I wouldn't say that, so I don't know about the Farsi English corpus, but for the Japanese English corpus, it's definitely as well as good as the FST framework that at and used in their prior work. For the IWSLT corpus, it's quite competitive. So then, the, then your improvements are better than Im anybody else has, has done on these tasks? Or? Yeah, the, I wouldn't say completely, um, it's almost close to the previous best results, but what we've done here, the point that's not made by the table that I would like to make in the next slide, is we've not only improved the blue score in these kinds of objective evaluation metrics, but we've also given, uh, uh, we facilitated the transfer of knowledge from the source to target side. So that's actually not evaluated here. So we've, if you know that a, a source utterance was a statement, we've also transferred the target utterance as a statement. So you know that knowledge, but that is not evaluated here. To do that, you would need human evaluation. So we did a small scale experiment in the lab by giving people not only the improved translations, but also what it meant on the source side. And you know, I don't have published results for that particular experiment as these, but almost nine in 10 people would prefer having what the intention of the source speech was rather than not. So they would rather have that information than not have that information. So if you can imagine a two-way communication uh, with a speech translation device, you would rather give that information in a dialogue scenario. So that's not computed here. So that's, that's something that conventional systems do not offer. So we also did some analysis of results in terms of where do we get all these gains from? Okay. So we did, we computed the blue score without dialogue acts and with dialogue act tags for each of the dialogue act tag category. So as you can see, the blue score improvement comes most from questions, acknowledgements, and appreciations, not that much from statements. Okay. So it's, it's actually intuitive because statements don't have kind of cue phrases that are characteristic. Okay? You can say anything that you want in a statement, but there are certain cue phrases like, are you going, or is it, is it something that you want? You know, these are the kinds of cue phrases that seem to be captured by the dialogue act specific translation table used for questions that is not captured by the statements. Okay. And the reason I have put the distribution of the number of dialogue act tags is you cannot just understand this table without looking at this, okay? Because the total number of statements is almost 90%. The number of questions is quite small. The number of other categories is also quite small. So you need to look at these improvements in results commensurate with the number of instances they appear in the training data. So as you see, statements are really high, but we're not getting much bang for the buck there. Even though questions are quite low, we get a much improved uh, blue score there. So what we did here, so um, we also analyzed the 42 tag scenario. I don't have the space to show what were the most important tags in the 42 tag case. But things like WH questions, yes, no questions, and open questions, those were the kinds of dialogue act tags that were very important. How am I doing on time? Great. Right. Yeah, we have, oh, I'm sorry, 12 minutes left, I guess. Okay. We should leave time for questions. Okay. Right. So <clears throat> in terms of the, the using dialogue act tags in translation, uh, by using well, the phrase-based translation, we were able to get better blue score. Uh, for the bag of words translation, we were able to improve the lexical selection accuracy. But again, the point is these are all objective evaluation metrics. People believe only when you say that you, know, you improve the system by so-and-so percentage. But we've also kind of, you know, I've not seen work that has kind of transferred the intention from the source to the target side. People are always interested in improving as many words as possible, but you're also transferring the intention. Um, <clears throat> so we've shown improvements in the objective metrics for all the language pairs, and uh, it's a novel technique that can potentially use, be used for disambiguation as well as uh, in a dialogue scenario to facilitate cross-lingual communication. Okay, so let's move on to the part where we can enrich translation with prosody. So before I go into the details of it, so let me show you a conventional system. So you have ASR, uh, you have machine translation, you have a hypothesized noisy text, okay, so it could possibly be erroneous. So if you were to detect the prosody labels from this target text, okay, you're using the noisy text here. It's a very inefficient way of doing it. In contrast, what we can do is 
factor the prosody labels within the translation framework. So there's this whole effort of using factor translation models recently where people are interested in incorporating linguistic knowledge such as morphology and uh, lemmas and other kinds of things. So can we use the prosody labels within the translation framework to get enriched target text and hope that this enriched target text is much better than doing a post-processing approach? Okay, so essentially, you want to couple it within the translation system. So I'll go over these slides actually quickly. I don't have too much of time, I think. <clears throat> OK, so the proposed framework here is at the output of ASR, what we're interested in doing is instead of just the source text going to target text, we're also interested in factoring these labels on the target side. And then hopefully using it for uh, text-to-speech synthesis. So one easy way of doing it is considering each label on the target side as a compound token. Okay? So you have the word, and then you have a particular prosody label associated with it. And you do the entire same phrase space translation that you want, now for a source word and a compound token on the target side. Now the problem with this is, say this particular Japanese word goes to call, but you have two different variants of call. Okay? You can either have call as an accented version, or you can have call as an unaccented version. So different words might go to the same version of call, but with different compound tokens. Okay? So that's essentially a problem there. So what we want to do here is, Use a factor translation approach. So this is the kind of this is something that I took from Philip Cohen's work. So in, we want to factor other kinds of rich information, either on the source side and or, the, or on the target side, and improve the translation between the words. Okay. So this is our factor translation approach. Essentially, what we want to do here is instead of going from the words to words on the target side, we want to generate words as well as prosody labels on the target side. This is model one. The other model is you go from words to words on the target side and then generate this. So essentially, you have a generation table where for each word, you know what prosody label you're going to generate. Okay. Now, the advantage here is that you can build the alignments on the words. So you don't have to build the alignments on the compound tokens and have some problems. And <clears throat> you can essentially factor the prosody labels within the translation framework. OK, so these are some experimental results again. So I've shown you lexical F-score and the blue score and something called as a prosodic accuracy. So prosodic accuracy is number, nothing but the number of labels that are correctly detected in the intersection of result and the reference divided by the total number of um, correct words that you get in the reference. So if you look at the prosodic accuracy for the post-processing approach and compare it with the two different factor translation models, you get almost an 8 to 16% improvement in assignment of these labels. So by factoring these labels within the translation framework and not doing it in a post-processing approach, we're able to get much more bang for the buck here. OK, so I didn't want to uh, go in, in depth into the prosody part. Uh, but just to give you an idea, this is recent work at ICSLP. Um, the factor translation models can enrich target output at no cost or at the word level performance. So we don't get a degraded blue score at the word level, but we get a much better prosodic assignment accuracy. And the models can also be particularly used for tonal languages such as Chinese, where you have to detect the lexical accent on the target side. And you need not just use prosody, but you can potentially integrate any other word level rich annotation in the framework. Okay. Okay, in conclusion, what we did here in, in this talk was I proposed a novel framework for enriching speech translation, which um, focuses on the transfer of prosodic as well as discourse context along with the content. Uh, we integrated both the source and target rich annotations, and we were able to achieve some promising improvements in translation quality. On the other hand, I also proposed some innovative techniques for automatic prosody recognition as well as dialogue act classification. And we were fortunate that the results that we obtained here were also state of the art. And these have also been developed as taggers, which I hope to make public soon. So more in terms of future work and plans. Um, so the rich representation part, I'm very interested in porting the work on prosody labeling to other languages. So I've done everything only for English. So I want to see how well it performs in other languages. But the other problem here is I'm relying on supervised data to do all these things. So I've been doing some work recently on doing semi-supervised adaptation. So given a new corpora, how can you bootstrap the labels based on the model that you have in hand? And in terms of using the representations in speech translation, 
um, you know, ultimate goal would be to develop a framework that you can unify speech translation. So essentially have ASR and MT as a coupled system and use all these representations both within ASR as well as the machine translation system. Uh, I've also done some work recently on, so I've all only described the pitch accent part for uh, prosody, but I've also done some work on using prosodic phrasing for input segmentation as well as reordering. So if you get these big indices that I mentioned, on the target side, you can do a lot of reordering on the target side to improve uh, MP performance. Okay, so you know this is more in terms of future plans. So hopefully, I can use all these skills to solve interesting problems in speech and language processing and make some meaningful contributions in both research and developing prototypes. Um, so I've also worked on several different projects, especially on the more on the ASR part, uh, but my thesis focused on this. So I have a quick video, actually. This is on using human-like speech processing by using articulatory information. So um, what you see here, are, it's basically the sagittal view. This is the upper lip, lower lip, and this is the tongue contour. So this is the incisor, this is the tongue tip, tongue body, and the tongue dorsum. And this is spontaneous speech, so as part of this is a separate work in graduate school life. I collected, cleaned up, created this database, as well as ran lots of experiments for improving ASR performance using articulatory features. So let me play this uh, video. So essentially, the sensors are recording the movements of the articulators, and you can use it along with the MFCC features. There's some of the list of publications. Thank you.